सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन टू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल ज्वाइन द ओनली ऑफिशियल टेलीग्राम चैनल ऑफ राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल टू गेट द रेलिवेंट मटीरियल एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट अपडेट्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड द वॉट वाई एंड हाउ ऑफ द न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस फ्रॉम द सिविल सर्विसेज एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव सो टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द हिंदू डेली एडिशन डेटेड थर्ड मार्च ट्वेंटी The topics to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and the time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So before starting our discussion of today's topic, let us look at the question for the mains weekly answer writing practice. The question asks you to discuss the benefits as well as challenges for India's dairy sector in the backdrop of India negotiating the comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with Australia. you have to answer this in 250 words that means that this question carries 15 marks so you are required to attempt this question on the e-learn platform and get it evaluated by our evaluation team so now we will move on to our first topic that is in relation to the recent report which is published by ipcc now we all are aware that ipcc stand for intergovernmental panel on climate change Now this article has appeared in today's the hindu edition at text and the context page which gets published in the online edition so the recent context of this news article is that recently ipcc has come up with a new report and has concluded that climate change has already produced irreversible losses and damage to multiple ecosystems including the land ecosystem coastal ecosystem as well as the marine ecosystem In this report IPCC has in detail reviewed the scientific evidence on natural ecological social as well as economic spheres Now as far as the UPSC scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic is mainly relevant from the mains perspective The general studies paper 3 mentions the topic environment and the micro topics of conservation environmental pollution and degradation as well as the disaster and disaster management Now we all know that in today's era the climate induced disasters are growing in frequency as well as intensity that is why this topic is relevant from the disasters point of view also so now we will move on to the detailed discussion of this topic in today's session we will discuss in brief about the IPCC as an organization and then we will discuss about the key features of this particular report in line with this in the end we will conclude that what can be a way ahead or a future strategy or the policy actions which can be taken in order to deal with the threats which are postulated in this report so first of all ipcc as an organization is concerned going to the historical background this ipcc was created in 1988 by wmo that stands for world meteorological organization in association with the unep that stands for united nations environment program Now WMO is also the specialized agency of the UN and UNEP is also one of the agencies of UN that means that IPCC is also a UN body Now the full form of IPCC we have already told in the beginning it stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change The main objective of IPCC is to provide the scientific informations to the government at all levels that is the central government the state governments or the case may be the local governments these scientific informations are then utilized by the respective governments to come up with the environmental policies in order to have a sustainable development that means that IPCC assesses the science which is related to climate change that means that ipcc is a specialized body in dealing and assessing the scientific information related to the climate change but the important point is from the prelims point of view that ipcc does not conduct the research of its own there are several contributors which are government players as well as the non government players which conduct their independent research ipcc then analyzes all those research and come up with their own conclusions and reports IPCC does not conduct the research of its own this point is very important because this can be asked in the form of statement in the MCQ in your prelims exam now we will move on towards the key features which are there in this report which we are talking about the first and the foremost thing is that IPCC has concluded that our beautiful planet earth has already entered into a phase whereby 
the climate induced impacts are irreversible that means that the earth is facing the irreversible changes now we all are aware about the discussions around the 1.5 degree celsius increase in temperature versus 2 degree celsius temperature rise now according to ipcc the world has already breached the limit of 1.5 degree celsius rise in temperature with reference to the pre industrial levels and we are right on the path of increasing the temperature by 2 degree celsius and that is why the changes which have already taken place in the earth's ecosystem biome biospheres and each and every part those changes have become irreversible there is a very less hope that the human actions can reverse these changes and can take the earth back to the pre-industrial levels that is not going to happen and that is the harsh reality in line with this this report further claims that less than 15% of the total land less than 21% of the global fresh water reservoirs and less than 8% of the global oceans are protected in today's time now you just try to imagine and analyze the impact of the climate change that we know that 75% of our earth is covered with the ocean bodies and in that 75% just less than 8% of the oceans are protected that means out of all the ocean bodies the anthropogenic activities have negatively impacted around 92% of that area and the similar mathematics can go for the freshwater reservoirs land or for that matter forest ecosystems mangrove ecosystems permafrost etc now suppose this is a rough global map and we will try to identify that which are the most vulnerable regions across the globe which are or may be impacted by the climate change first of all the most vulnerable region as per this report is the south asian region that is where we live this report has said that the south asian region has become the hot spot this is because of the rise in the events of cyclones on the west as well as east coast that is from the arabian sea as well as the bay of bengal rising hunger heat waves cold waves growing erraticity in the south asian monsoon rise in extreme weather events and melting of glaciers so all of these reasons are responsible for making this particular region as the hot spot in line with this we will also try to identify the further regions for example let us take the sahara and sub sahara region which lies in the northern africa now this region also has its own challenges for example it has a low economic development high weather extremity because this region has hot desert similarly if we go into these areas that is madagascar region or for that matter the entire coastal areas of the world as well as these islands in the southeast asian region these regions are prone to coastal flooding because of the rise in the melting of the glaciers in turn leading to rise in the sea level the coastal regions have become highly vulnerable to climate induced disasters and these problems are not restricted to the developing countries alone for example for the last few years the europe is continuously witnessing the heat waves now we all know that europe lies in the temperate latitudes that is higher latitudes and the general climate of the europe is cold climate despite those cold climates europe is experiencing heat waves the scandinavian countries are experiencing melting of the glaciers the fjords you might have heard are the glacial landforms which lie in the coastal areas are melting away similar is the case with the north american continent you might have heard about the polar vortex recently there was also a bomb cyclone which we have already covered in the previous dns in detail then you have also heard about the amazonian fires the last year's australian bush fires is known to everyone then is also the melting of antarctica so the point is that all these activities convince us that climate change is a reality and we have entered into a phase of irreversible changes this report claims that around 3.3 to 3.6 billion people across the globe are highly vulnerable and majority of this portion are living in the coastal areas now we'll come to the next point 
This report has given us four important factors which have led to this dramatic change in the Earth's ecosystem. The first is the unsustainable use of natural resources because we know that continuously the demand is rising in the backdrop of rise in industrialization, population as well as urbanization. Because of this rise in demand, various multinational companies as well as factories are engaging themselves into unsustainable practices. And in lieu of getting the natural resources at any cost, we are resorting to the unsustainable practices which are not in line with the preservation and conservation of our natural ecosystem. The second factor is the habitat fragmentation. Because of this very factor, for example, we are constructing the roads. Now, in order to boost the economy of any country, the road infrastructure performs the role of arteries. But those roads divide the natural habitat. For example, there was a national park and if roads passes through that national park, now the migration pattern of the species across this road will be severely affected. That is why habitat fragmentation is the second most factor which has pushed the earth into the phase of irreversible changes. Then the third is the pollutant increase. Because of the continuous rise in the pollution in the atmosphere, we are well aware about several impacts. For example, a rise in smog. Now this smog is very dangerous. For example, the rise in low level ozone pollution. Now all these things are dangerous not just for the human health but also for the plant's health or the animal health. The wildlife species are impacted to a great level and that is why this pollutant increase is one of the major factors behind the loss of biodiversity. And the fourth and the last reason is the most dominant factor that is the climate change. What are the multidimensional impacts of climate change? We are continuously discussing it since beginning. Be it agriculture productivity, be it the food security, be it the disasters, be it the deteriorating standard of living. Almost each and everything which affects the human life is somehow associated with the natural climate of that particular region. So if we have understood all these dimensions now the question arises that is there a ray of hope? Can humans do something about this scenario? Yes, this report is not pessimistic in sense and we should never be pessimistic. Now you just imagine that if you are selected in this examination which you surely are going to do, just think that it will be your responsibility as a person in authority to deal with all these challenges because all these issues on one hand are global in nature but also the local in nature too. India is facing almost all these issues. So that is why you are going to be the person in authority to deal with such scenario. So the question is that what can be the future strategy to deal with these things. Now this article says that report has given us four primary strategies or the principles which we need to follow which the government need to accommodate in their policies for sustainable development. The first and the foremost thing is the reforms which are needed in the sector of agriculture. We all are aware about the unsustainable practices which are going on in our agricultural ecosystem. That is the use of chemicals, unscientific use of machineries, unsustainable irrigation practices and all these things. So the point is that we need to accommodate the principles of agroecology. Now the principles of agroecology takes the ecological as well as the social concepts of sustainable agriculture. Now the thing is that we understand that what can be the ecological concepts of sustainable agriculture. For example, rationalizing of the irrigation in order to conserve the groundwater. That is the ecological concept of the sustainable agriculture. But what are the social concepts which are associated with agriculture? For example, take the dietary habits of people. If the diet of the people are unbalanced, that means for example, if we are excessively dependent on one or two crops, let, let us suppose that is wheat and rice, which we are presently dependent on. If we are excessively dependent on wheat and rice, that means that the demand of the wheat and rice will continuously increase, which in turn will push the farmers to grow wheat and rice only. Because only the wheat and rice can give the farmers the desired profit. 
and this practice in turn will result in reduction of the crop rotation practices. The agriculture will be skewed towards the growing of wheat and rice and the other things for example pulses, millets will lag behind. So now the dietary pattern was not ecological in nature but was the social dimension. If we can take such social concepts in planning our agriculture that is known as the root of the agroecology principles. The second step which this report says that the government should take the necessary health actions. The government should promote the portable water. The government should strengthen the early warning response systems as well as the sanitation systems. Because this report says that climate change has a direct bearing on the human health. That is why the health actions are of prime importance. The third important thing which this report says that government should promote behavioral incentives as well as economic instruments. This needs to be done in order to promote and motivate the companies, the factories as well as the other institutions in order to come up with the sustainable practices. For example, this report says that the companies can be incentivized, they can be given economic instruments in order to come up with the climate risk disclosures. If the companies voluntarily disclose their climate risks, the degree of their climate risk, then the associated planning can be done at the governmental level as well as at the company level too. But for this to disclose these climate risks, the government should provide certain incentives to those companies. Otherwise, no company will be interested in disclosing their climate risks. And the last thing which this report says is that we should promote the climate resilient development based on three pillars of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, increasing the carbon dioxide sinks and coming up with multiple sources to promote the climate finance. If we are able to achieve these three things, we can surely promote the climate resilient development. So that was everything which was in relation to this report which you need to be aware about. Now let us revise this topic in brief once again. Initially, we discussed the IPCC as an organization and we said that it is a UN body created by WMO and UNEP. The main function of the IPCC is to provide scientific information, analyze the science related to climate change and providing all these things to the government for the formulation of sustainable development policies. But the important point was that IPCC does not conduct the research of its own. Then we came up across the key features of this report which claim that we have entered into the irreversible changes phase. With the help of this map, we understood that what are those areas which are highly vulnerable and in the end we also discussed that what are those four factors which are majorly responsible for this scenario. In the end we discussed that what can be the future strategy ahead and this strategy will be based on four pillars. First, agroecological principles, second health actions, third behavioral as well as economic incentives and third climate resilient development. Now we will take up the next topic which is very important and is highly relevant from the upcoming mains examinations point of view. This is because this topic presents altogether different dimension linking the Ukraine-Russia war with the principles of Dhamma as articulated by Ashok. Now under this session, we will discuss that what were the exact Dhamma principles of the Ashokan policy and how is it relevant in the present context. As far as the UPSC scheme of syllabus is concerned, this dimension of topic becomes important for the general studies paper for ethics. Because under this section, we have the micro topic listed as lessons from the lives and teachings of great leaders and reformers. Moreover, if you go by the previous year questions trained in the UPSC, regularly there are several questions which are asked in this frame of reference. For example, in UPSC 2020, the question was asked, what teachings of Buddha are most relevant today and why? Discuss. Similarly, in UPSC 2016, the question was asked about the concept of seven sins of Mahatma Gandhi. Similarly, the relevance of the Ashokan Dhamma policy in present context or the concept of the Dhamma policy of Ashoka 
can be asked in the upcoming memes. As we have discussed that the context of this particular news article is in the Russo-Ukrainian war which has called for the anti-war ethics in international relations. Now most of you are already aware about this fact, the remorse, the change in the Ashokan personality in the post-culling situation. Those who have read history are all aware about the brutal nature of Ashoka in the pre-culling war. He fought the Kalinga war because of his own interest in which it is estimated that lakhs of people were killed. And this was the incident which transformed the Ashoka into the Great Ashoka. Now it is to be understood in a mature sense that the greatness which was associated with Ashoka was not just restricted to his winning streak and the wars which he fought. But the greatness was also associated in the remorse in the transformation of the personality with which he did after the Kalinga war. When he saw that because of his own interest, lakhs of people have died in the Kalinga war, he felt that he was the sole person responsible for this mass death. And that is why in the post-Kalinga period it is witnessed that he developed the anti-war ethics. He became of the firm opinion that the fame is not to be built upon the victories of the war but on the principles of non-violence and gratitude. In this very reference, we should understand that what exactly do we mean by Dhamma policy. Now Dhamma, this word is the Prakrit translation of the Sanskrit word that is Dharma. Now dharma stands for morality, that is why the dharma policy of the Ashok dealt with the public morality as well as the political morality. The core, the crux of the dharma policy was the welfare of all the living beings, not just restricted to the human beings but also the plants, animals, all the living beings. And how was it to be fulfilled? It was to be fulfilled by overcoming the greed and sorrows. Because as per the Buddhist teachings, if you go down to the basic reason, the root cause of any evil, those are just two. That is the greed or the sorrows. You take any evil, whether it is the Ukrainian invasion, whether it was the Afghanistan invasion, or in the personal life also, whether it is growing materialism or objectification of women, each and every evil is somehow related to the greed or sorrows. That is why the Dhamma principles advocated overcoming of greed and sorrows. The principles of this Dhamma policy are enlisted as here. These principles are to be memorized by you because in prelim examination the question can come in the form of match the columns or in the mains examination in ethics or in GS paper 1 you can directly use such principles. Further, these principles can also be used by you in your essays. That is why you need to know all these principles. The first principle of the Dhamma policy is the mastery of senses. Even if you go by the Gita ethics, if you remember the teachings of Lord Krishna in Mahabharata, he is also of the firm opinion that one should be sthit pragya. Now what is this sthit pragya? Sthit pragya personality is the one who is sthit, that is sthir, unmoved by different situations whether he is happy or he is sad but he is unmoved his personality is not fragile he has a stable personality and this can be achieved only when you can master your senses you can control your senses the second principle of the dhamma policy is the truthfulness and honesty the third principle is purity the purity of thoughts purity of words and purity of soul the fourth principle is of service, before you come other. And even the job for which you are looking, that is the job of public service. You are going to become a public servant. So that is why this principle service is of utmost importance and relevance for you people. The next principle is support, that is you must support to people who are in need of it. Next related principle is charity and kindness. Further, for the intellectual as well as spiritual well-being, the Dhamma principles also suggest the path of devotion. If you go by the life of the great king Ashoka, in the post-Kaling war period, he was devoted to the Buddhist teachings. 
and that is why this principle of devotion is also important further the next principle is of gratitude reverence and purity of thoughts all these principles together make the dhamma policy of buddhist teachings now from the examinations point of view the question arises that what is the relevance of dhamma policy in today's world so we will discuss this point by point the first and the foremost thing is that we are all aware that presently humanity is facing an extreme violence now this violence is not just at the personal level but this violence is also at the political national as well as international level the recent example is the context of this very article that is the ukraine russian war however that is not restricted to this war there are extreme violence being faced by different countries by different gender by different caste or by different religions in several parts of the world be it the rohingya violence be it the violence against women or anything so this extreme violence has to be tackled and eliminated by following the principles of ahimsa non violence in deed words and thoughts as we have briefly discussed that the non violence was the basic principle of ashoka in the post kalinga war because by then he became a clear devotee of buddhism the second important thing is that the dhamma principles can also be used to stop the cruelty against animals the principles of daya and karuna sees the life even in the smallest of living creatures as we earlier discussed that the dham principle was the welfare of all and this all was not restricted to human beings the same is also the principles of daya and karuna for all the third thing is to promote the peace and prosperity in different parts and different sections of the society the principles of sarva dharma sambhav is of utmost importance now we have several reports for example of growing income inequality let's say oxfam report which suggests that most of the wealth is concentrated in a very few hands so in order to have inclusive development peace and prosperity for all principles of sarva dharma sambhav is relevant now bilateral relations between two hostile nations can also be upgraded to friendly relations by following the principles of dhamma vijay with greater cultural engagements and people to people interactions when you study international relations you come across multiple types of diplomacy whenever we talk about building the relationships of two countries that cannot be done only at the political levels that has to be done at the people level also because the cultural interactions people to people interactions provide the base of a strong relationship because then the relationship is built not on the selfish motives or interest but on the emotions trust love and faith coming to the next point in order to boost the honest conduct and probity in the public life the principle of truthfulness is important because the principle of truthfulness or honesty boost the further principles of transparency as well as accountability and we can understand that if there is transparency and accountability in a society we can expect the probity in public life and in this very line for the good governance the principles of paternal kingship is of utmost importance the basic philosophy of this paternal kingship is that the one who is ruling or who is formulating the laws in the modern context for example the democratic governments obviously the democratic governments cannot be built on the kings but the core thing is that whosoever is in the position of authority he must treat all the citizens which he is ruling or governing as equal as his or her kids so that there is no partisanship among all the sections of the citizens so that is why the idea of the good governance can be taken from the principles of paternal kingship next in order to build league of morally and ethically enlightened citizens the ideals of sanyam that is mastery of senses and bhav shuddhi that is purity of thoughts must be advocated and in the last the ideals of kritagyata that is gratitude and apichiti that is reverence are of high relevance in order to build a good family and society 
सो दैट इज हाउ वी कैन डिस्कस और क्लेम दैट दी धमा प्रिंसिपल ऑफ अशोका विच वॉज लेड डाउन इन अराउंड थ्री हंड्रेड सेंचुरी बी सी इज स्टिल रेलिवेंट इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू एंड इज गोइंग टू बी स्टिल रेलिवेंट फॉर नंबर ऑफ कमिंग सेंचुरीज एंड कमिंग बैक to the examination this is the clear indication that how you can think about the relevance of any concept whether it is ashoka's dhamma principles or the gandhian seven sins or the buddha's principles of non violence anything here is a line of thought in which you can think and write your beautiful mail answers now we will move on to our next topic now this topic is in relation to the death sentence that is capital punishment and the debate around the relevancy of the capital punishment and its ethicality or morality have been continuing since many years in india despite many arguments against the capital punishment still the capital punishment exists in india despite the fact that many other countries developing as well as developed countries have done away with the capital punishment in this backdrop we need to know that what are the arguments which support the capital punishment as well as the arguments which are against the capital punishments this topic has appeared on page number 6 in today's the hindu edition as far as the context of this article is concerned the article highlights about the capital punishments awarded to 38 convicts accused of the bomb blast in the ahmedabad by the sessions court in gujarat now in today's session we will look at some of the legal aspects of this capital punishment then we will look at arguments in favor and against the capital punishment and in the end we will look at some of the recommendations which are made by the law commission chaired by justice ap shah so now we will begin with the legal aspects of the capital punishment as per the ipc there are two sections which are linked to capital punishment section 302 and section 303 The section 302 is very famous you all are aware about it that whoever commits the murder shall be punished with the death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine now here one important term is imprisonment for life under the indian law the imprisonment for life means that the person will be imprisoned throughout his entire life until the death the section 303 says that whoever being under the sentence of imprisonment for life commits the murder shall be punished with the death now these two sections that is 302 and 303 of the ipc deals with the capital punishment that is the death sentence now we will look at the code of the criminal procedure now this code tells the criminal procedure this elaborates upon the procedure which will to be followed while arriving at the conclusions of the ipc now here three sections are important section 366 section 368 and section 369 now under the indian law the capital punishment or the death sentence can be prescribed by the session court or the high courts however there is one condition which is according to section 366 if the death sentence has been passed by the session court the proceedings of that shall be submitted to the high court and the capital punishment or the death sentence shall not be executed unless it is confirmed by the high court this means that even if the sessions court have awarded the capital punishment the punishment cannot be executed unless the high court has confirmed that punishment now once the proceedings are submitted to the high court then comes the role of section 368 now logically the options available to high court under section 368 is that it may confirm the sentence or it may pass any other sentence warranted by law it may annul the conviction and convict the accused of any offence of which the court of sessions might have convicted him or order a new trial altogether further the high court may also acquit the accused person depending upon the proofs which are submitted to it Now section 369 says that whenever the high court is dealing with such a case that death sentence shall be presided by a division bench that is the bench of two judges or more and order should be signed by at least two judges of the bench that means a single judge bench cannot preside and award the death sentence so the legal angle which we have discussed till now is related to the ipc and crpc now we will come towards the constitutional angle now if you go by the article 21 of the fundamental rights in indian constitution it says 
that the no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to the procedure established by law now this article is very important because this article formed the basis of the bachan singh judgment by supreme court there is a very famous case bachan singh versus state of punjab in which the certain guidelines regarding the capital punishment were laid down in this very case it was said that the capital punishment should only be awarded in the rarest of the rare cases and the supreme court held that the death penalty given to a convict is constitutional and will be done in the rarest of rare cases now here is important point the supreme court has called the capital punishment as constitutional now the question arises why the answer is in this very article because the supreme court said that if there is article 21 in our constitution which says that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law that means that if the due procedure which is established by law is followed then a person can be deprived of his life or personal liberty and this procedure we have already read in the crpc because the code of criminal procedure lays down the exact procedure which is to be followed while awarding the death sentence the supreme court said that the capital punishment is not against the right to life and personal liberty as guaranteed under article 21 because the death penalty through capital punishment has been established under the law that is section 366 of the crpc and is a legal process and therefore the state is empowered to take away the life of citizens through the procedure established by law if they are found guilty of crime committed which is punishable with death penalty and is the rarest of rare case so this was the legal angle now we will come to the discussion that what are the arguments in favor of capital punishment and against the capital punishment now the most important argument in favor of capital punishment is that it is based on the deterrent theory there are certain crimes for which there should be a deterrence in the society so that those crimes are not repeated again in the society and it is believed that the capital punishment for the crimes such as murder terrorism genocide etc will instill the fear of punishment including the death among the wrong doers the second argument is related to the morality of the capital punishment now the argument says that keeping an accused of the heinous crimes alive at the cost of the lives of the number of citizens or potential victim of society is morally wrong suppose there is one person and he has committed a mass genocide or he has bombed certain city and hundreds of civilians were killed in that bomb blast so the argument says that it will be morally incorrect to keep this person alive because he has taken the lives of so many citizens the third argument we have already discussed that article 21 allows the state to take the life of any person but according to the procedure established by law and the guideline of the supreme court for the rarest of rare cases the next argument is that death penalty also allows allows for the right to appeal the indian laws and the constitution allow for appeal against the decisions of the high court and even the supreme court further those who have read polity you are aware about the fact of the pardoning powers of the president even if the supreme court has awarded the death punishment the aggrieved can go to the president and appeal for its pardoning now we'll discuss the arguments which are against the capital punishment first and the foremost argument is that it ensures the retribution by the states but here we should understand that there is a difference between the retributive justice and vengeance we all know that an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind so the argument to take the life of the person who has already committed some crime this will not end the second argument is that there might be some people who are suffering from mental illness and death penalty should not be imposed on them The United Nations Commission on Human Rights calls upon the countries not to impose the death penalty on a person suffering from any form of mental disorder. And the third important argument which is against the capital punishment which defies the basic logic of the capital punishment is several studies have suggested us that it does not help in reducing or deterring the heinous crimes. 
बिकॉज दिस वॉज द फर्स्ट आर्ग्यूमेंट विच वॉज मेड इन फेवर ऑफ द कैपिटल पनिशमेंट द बेसिक लॉजिक ऑफ द कैपिटल पनिशमेंट वॉज बेस्ड ऑन द डेटरेंट थ्योरी बट स्टडीज आर सजेस्टिंग दैट इट इज नो मोर अ डेटरेंट द रीजन इज दैट जस्ट हैविंग अ लीगल पनिशमेंट फॉर सम क्राइम विल नॉट क्रिएट अ डेटरेंट इफेक्ट अनटिल एंड अनलेस दैट लॉ इज एनफोर्स्ड but we are all aware about the plight the conditions of a judiciary the speedy trials which rarely take place in such cases and because of this there is a huge time gap between awarding of the death penalty and its execution and this keeps the offenders waiting on the death row further impacting their mental health so in a sense it becomes the double punishment for the convicts now in this very line there are certain important recommendations as well as important opinions of the law commission in this regard first of all the law commission suggests that studies claim that death punishment or the capital sentence is not serving as a deterrence the second point also we have discussed that there is a difference between the retribution and vengeance retribution has an important role to play in the punishment however it cannot be reduced to vengeance the notion of an eye for an eye has no place in our constitutionally mediated criminal justice system and it fails to achieve any constitutionally valid societal goals the third important point is the restorative and reformative justice loses focuses on death penalty because when death penalty becomes the norm the only focus is to award the death sentence or to the person who has committed that very offense in this very sense the process of reforming that convict does not take place the attention is diverted from reformative justice to just taking the path of eye for an eye and in this very continuation it diverts the public attention from other problems ailing the criminal justice system now there is a huge hue and cry to award the death punishment on some person in all such protests somehow the attention towards reforming our overall criminal justice system for example the issues of poor investigation crime prevention rights of the victims of the crime they get sidelined so that is why we should also focus on the means that is the criminal justice system the need of the r thus is to reform this criminal justice system time to time there have been several concerns which have been expressed by the supreme court on the arbitrariness in awarding the death sentence it has been witnessed that multiple session court are not going into detail they are not looking at some of the alternative punishments which can be provided to some convicts they just go for the straight forward and short route that is to award it that is to award the death punishment the court has said that extremely uneven application of the bachan singh has given a rise to the state of uncertainty in capital sentencing law which clearly falls foul of constitutional due process and equality principle further studies also suggest that death sentence is disproportionately affecting the vulnerable sections people belonging to scheduled caste scheduled tribes minority religions are the ones who bore the brunt of such sentences then comes the delays which are faced by the death row convicts and in that delay the death penalty act as a double punishment which we have discussed above further in the beginning i also told you that most of the civilized nations have abolished the death penalty around 140 countries have now abolished the law in practice which demonstrates the evolving standards of the human dignity and decency do not support the death penalty so the bottom line the conclusion is that the commission has accordingly recommended that the death penalty be abolished for all crimes other than the terrorism related offenses and waging the war affecting the national security so while writing our mains answer this can be your conclusion which is supported by the law commission's recommendations because the fact is that despite several arguments against the death penalty the supreme court has constitutionally upholded it and the indian legal system is still having the death penalty so that is why the conclusion can be on the basis of this middle path which is supported by the supreme court as well as the law commission so now is the time for the question of the day the question asked in yesterday's dns was in relation to the black sea 
the question said that which of the following is are the port cities situated in the black sea there were three options given the first was sevastopol second odessa and third sochi the correct answer to this question is option d that is 1 2 and 3 the question from today's dns is in relation to the sixth assessment report and you have to find that which of the following bodies releases this report the option a is ipcc option b unep option c wef and option d world bank